Hi there, grade 11s, and welcome to our next video dealing with module 1.6. And we're looking at the dark side of computing. So let's look at um, some of the things that we're going to be chatting about. We're going to be looking at the human and social aspects and then the criminal side of things. So this is what we find within this module. The first one we're looking at is just the human and social aspects. We're looking at the technical aspects of protecting ourselves from human errors in computing. Remember, the computer can only do, unless it's AI, <laughs> but it can only do what we tell it to do. So the reason we look at this is because we want to talk about things like information accuracy. If you are capturing the data of an entire school, the names, the numbers, the you know contact details, the parental details, etc., do you think it's important that that information be accurate? Yes, especially in the case of an emergency. So we know that there are errors. We know that you know failures can come in. Um, some of the systems can fail. But sometimes it can be caused by any of these three items. Okay, Number one, bad programming. That means that the program itself, they, they are problems, they are errors, and I've encountered this a lot when um, I used to work for an outside company, and they implemented new software. Many times, you only find out what the software can and can't do when it's actually been used by the users, and this is where you usually pick up errors, and if there's some bad programming, that means in the coding it itself, something is wrong there, um, the software is not going to do what it's supposed to. On the other side, there could be poor training. In other words, people haven't been trained properly or correctly in order to use the software effectively. And when they feel that, oh, you know what, I'm, I keep making mistakes in the software, um, they end up losing trust in the system. And this goes for any sort of software, especially... Um, when it's, you know, a whole new piece of software that people haven't encountered before. There could also be poor procedures, poor procedures around capturing data. I want you to think about Microsoft Access. In Access, we put in validation rules, validation text, we put in input masks to ensure that the info being, you know, typed in, uh, the, the data that's been entered is done so in an accurate manner that we we get what we actually want out of this. Because if that data has been typed in incorrectly and you start pulling reports and you start pulling queries from that and you start generating things from that incorrect data, yeah, you're going to end up with bad information. Okay, and, and this is exactly what they're saying. Errors and failures lead to inaccurate information and have negative consequences. It can lead to a breakdown in user trust. You can have incorrect decision making. If you are making decisions based on data and that data is incorrect, um, that can have severe consequences. There can be decreased product quality. And I just want you to think about this. Many of you would have seen um, the whole buzz around Elon Musk and that whole booster rocket, you know, that went up and then came down by itself. I want you to think about the data and instructions and the coding that goes into that. Can you imagine if there's some sort of error in that. What is going to happen to that piece of equipment that is in the either hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, right? It's going to lead to incorrect decision making. It's going to lead to the quality of the product being just bad. So there's two terms we need to know. First one is data verification. And this is the way to ensure that the user has entered what they intended to enter. The most common example is where a user must enter their password twice to ensure that they have typed it in correctly. So that's verifying the data that's been entered. Data validation ensures that the data stored complies with a set of rules to avoid errors. Remember our validation rule and validation text in Access, right? It's exactly what it is. Maybe using an, an input mask to ensure that the data is exactly what you want it to be. Remember with our input mask, you could say you wanted like three letters and two numbers and another three letters. It's all part of data validation. 
So when we talk about the breakdown in user trust, um, if that software doesn't work properly, if the data is not correct, making bad decisions, people are then going to make excuses not to use it. They are going to run manual backup systems because they're not going to want to use whatever you have. And it can lead to an increased workload because people are going to be less efficient because they are not going to want to use the systems that are there. Then when we go back to the incorrect or delayed decision making, well, people are not going to trust the information. They are going to delay their decision making or they are going to just plan out, you know, make the wrong decision. Why? Because they've been given the wrong data. It can cost money or in some cases even lives. Like I'm using the example of a spaceship. You know, you want to launch that thing. You want to have four people on board. You want to get to the moon. Can you imagine the amount of data, the data verification, the data validation, checking, rechecking, all of that so that you can make the best possible decision? If you make a wrong move there, if your data is wrong and your information is wrong, it can cost people their lives. And then, like we mentioned, poor information accuracy leads to decreased product quality as well because people use this information um, and those who do use it must learn how to analyze interpret and judge the quality of the information so this goes for us as well then they talk a little bit about data protection and you know why we want to make sure that we protect our data you want to control access to your physical data okay think about the things that are on your phone the things that are on your laptop you want to control access to that because somebody can steal it. Somebody can gain access to it and delete it. Some, at you know, some stage you want to even control access to the computer. That's why we have usernames and passwords for you to log on. I know some on your desktops and laptops at home, you've got no username and password and anyone that switches it on can just go into the device. Okay, you don't want that. You also want to limit and control the use of portable storage. Why? Because when you store things on there and anything can get lost, misplaced or damaged, you'll lose that data. Okay, then we look at the criminal side of things. And our first one, this is something that always comes up, always comes up, grade 11, grade 12, the term social engineering. Please know this term. It is the use of deception to manipulate or con someone into giving out confidential information or into giving access to their computer or Premises. Now, this can be used to impersonate them, to install malware, or to commit any sort of fraud. And then they give us a few typical examples of social engineering. Um, and one of the common ones is when you get an email telling you that you've won the lotto. But think now, have you entered? No. So how can you enter a lotto that you never, sorry, how can you win the lotto when you never entered? Perhaps they're offering you a job or business opportunity. Sure, be careful, people. Telling you of an unexpected inheritance from a family member that you never even knew you had. Now, there might be the 0.0001% chance that it could be true. But generally, it's not. Telling you that there's a problem with your online banking details, folks, they will not be messaging you privately or sending you emails with regards to that. Okay, then we look at some of the best protection against so, uh, social engineering. Well, remember, if it sounds too good to be true, then it probably is. Also, know the people you work with and don't trust strangers around your data. Right? Be skeptical of offers that need something from you. So they tell you, no, you can get this, you can get that inheritance, but you just need to pay a small registration fee. Folks, we need to think before we act. It will go a long way in helping us um, fight against and be safe um, around social engineering. There's also the computer misuse where computer resources are used without permission or for tasks not authorized by the owner of the computer. Now, especially in the workplace, this can cut productivity and steals both computer time and work time. Why? Because you're doing things on the PC at work that has nothing to do with your work nothing to do with it okay 
Um, we also talk about the invasion of privacy. Now, I've had to, as a teacher, I've had to deal with this, and I'm sure many of you um, who are teachers listening to this will identify with these with this scenario. Yeah, looking at your boyfriend or girlfriend's SMS messages on their phone without them knowing. It invades their privacy as much as any company that tracks what you do on the internet. Now, I want to throw another scenario in here. If you are logged in on your social media via somebody else's phone, so you've forgotten your phone at home, you use your friend's phone, you log into your social media, right? Instagram, whatever. Don't forget to log out. Because when your friend later on in the day opens Instagram, it's going to open your Instagram page. And they will be able to see your messages and, yeah, your feed and all these lovely things. But for the person who does that, what should, ethically, what should you do? If you open Instagram and you see it's not your account, you log out of that and you log in with your own account. You don't first have a look at everything and see what the person's done in the messages, etc. And then you decide, um, now that I've had a good look and I maybe responded to one or two people, now I'll log out. It's not your account. Get out there. Right? It's an invasion of privacy. And unfortunately, some of the consequences of that is a loss of productivity, identity theft, and your online view of reality is customized to match what companies think you will like. I don't know if you've taken note of the fact that even now, when you talk around your phone, you start getting content online that falls in line with what you actually spoke about. Try it out. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've taken note of that already. And then we have malware, and please malware, remember, is the um, term for malicious software, harmful programming, and it takes many forms. You've got ransomware, you've got viruses, you've got spyware, but this is the umbrella term for all of these. It all falls under malware. And there are some social implications or social consequences of malware. Um, you know, you've got the financial cost, uh, this, yo, ransomware, hectic. We've had schools hit with ransomware, um, where an email has been sent, somebody's clicked on the link, it's, you know, allowed this piece of software to go through into the servers, get the usernames and password, lock everyone out, and then they demand a ransom, right? It could be lost productivity, and there are personal implications as well when it comes to malware. So of these things, I would say generally just know what those consequences are. You might not have to give an example of each, but maybe just know one. But folks, that is really it for um, what you need to know as far as this module that deals with the dark side of computing. <laughs> <laughs>